thank you for joining us for this Green Seal webinar. Today, we are hearing from experts about asthma in schools and how we can improve our school's indoor air quality through green cleaning. During this webinar, please feel free to write your questions in the comment area, and our panelists will address these questions at the end of this event. This webinar will be recorded and will be available with a transcript. My nonprofit organization, Green Seal, sees indoor air quality improvement as a key purpose of the work that we do. Green Seal develops science-based standards for many types of products, cleaning services, hotels, and restaurants. These are environmental leadership standards, which means we look at the leaders on the market and we capture how these products have a reduced impact on our health and the environment when compared to a conventional product. Using these standards, we certify leadership products and services. You can download for free our 31 environmental leadership standards and see all 4,000 certified products and services on our website. Thousands of schools across the U.S. are currently purchasing and using Green Seal certified products as a key tactic in their asthma prevention strategies. We'll hear about using certified products and asthma prevention management strategies in today's webinar. During this webinar, our experts will tell us about the pathophysiology of asthma, details of exposure, they will describe the challenges that schools face when it comes to indoor air quality, and we will hear success stories from an award-winning school executive who has successfully implemented green cleaning in her district. Our first expert panelist, Alicia Stevens, is a health assessor for the state of New Jersey and has vast experience with these topics. Alicia, please take it away. Thank you. My name is Alicia Stevens. Uh, my background is in toxicology and environmental science and occupational health. Basically, I'm going to give a, a primer on the connection between indoor air quality and asthma. Starting first with the pathophysiology of asthma. Asthma, trigger, asthma triggers, particularly in schools, the differences in risk for students, teachers, and staff, and cleaning team, and finally, green, some basic green cleaning principles. When we talk about the term indoor air quality, IAQ, we're referring to the environmental characteristics inside buildings that may affect health, comfort, or school, or work performance. Next. What is asthma? Asthma is a chronic lung disease that inflames and narrows the airways, causing wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, and coughing, particularly at night or early in the morning. People with asthma have inflamed airways. They're swollen, very sensitive, and tend to react strongly to some inhaled substances, substances that are indoor and outdoor allergens and irritants. If you think of the airway as a straw and you're trying to breathe through it, you can get the analogy. Airways become inflamed and swollen, uh, the muscles tighten, and mucus increase, and there's no way to get air in and out. Asthma is different for each person. Asthma can be cured, but can be controlled. One of the controls that we use is prevention. Okay? Prevention from exposure to indoor and outdoor allergens and irritants. Diagnosis of asthma is based on your medical and family history, physical exam, and test results. Next. Asthma is common. About 26 million people have asthma, and of those, 7 million are children under 18. One in 11 children have asthma. One in 12 adults have asthma. Black children are two times more likely to have asthma than white children. The cause of asthma is unknown. People think an inherited, well, there's an inherited tendency to develop allergies in 5% of the population. Also. If you have parents with asthma, there's also an increase that you may get it. And finally, environmental exposures also have a tendency, have a possibility for you to have asthma. We know that more boys have asthma than girls. In adults, more women than men have asthma. The role of gender and sex hormones is unclear. We also know that more people, or most people who have asthma, also have allergies. And some people develop occupational asthma from contact with chemicals or dust in the workplace. Next. 
asthma is disruptive. Asthma is a serious health and economic concern in the United States. Nearly one in two children with asthma report missing at least one day of school each year because of asthma. One in three adults, or nearly one in three adults with asthma report missing at least one day of work each year because of asthma. And finally, three in five people with asthma limit their physical activity. Asthma is also deadly. Approximately nine people die from asthma each day. Next. Let's look at the difference of asthma in adults and children. Childhood asthma and adult asthma are the same disease. They carry many of the same symptoms, similar medications are used. However, children with asthma face different challenges than adults with asthma. Children are often at a different and increased risk from environmental hazards than that for the adults. This susceptibility begins at preconception and continues throughout the life. Age-specific periods of susceptibility are termed windows of vulnerability. Asthma usually appears first in children and then, um, then more than in adults. Next. Remember, children are not little adults. They're very different. Um, children usually have increased exposures per kilogram of body weight compared to adults. Children also, due to their greater respiratory rates, breathe a proportionately greater volume of air than adults. Children's behavior such as hand-to-mouth and hand-to-object behavior result in a differing exposure. Children have a longer life expectancy. Therefore, they have a longer, longer to manifest a disease, a longer time to live with the toxic damage. And finally, children are polit politically powerless. They're defenseless. If you put a child in the classroom and basically tell him to stay in that room, he will stay in that room, he or she will stay in that room as long as they need to, even though they're um, having problems with asthma, having problems with breathing. Next. Okay, this is a chart of the seasonal hospital admission for children with asthma in New Jersey in 2008 to 2009. As you can see, the children's admissions fluctuate monthly. It, it, it changes. But we're really looking at the asthma hospitalization by admission month relative to July by age group. As you can see, the greatest number of hospitalization is seen in the fall month, usually September, and spring, which is May. The lowest rates are generally seen in July. Okay? It's a four time difference from July to um, sorry, from May to July or September to July. Next, student performance. Students with asthma may be at a higher risk for poor performance. Schools with fewer janitorial staff and higher maintenance backlogs show poor academic performance. Sometimes this difference can be up to 5 to 10 percent difference in the um, math and reading scores. We also see the ventilation rates are the same way. So the higher the ventilation rate, the higher the score. Next, let's switch a little bit to the environmental triggers, the things that are causing this. Although asthma can be caused by a one-time high-level exposure to an irritating chemical, it is more often caused by a repeated chemical, small exposure to a chemical. This process is called sensitization. Next, these are the common seven asthma triggers in schools. Just want to bring attention to a couple. Uh, the first one is the cockroach trigger being a cockroach and ants, pesticides basically. Uh, we handle this generally by sanitation, keeping the areas clean, and we use baits or gel if possible to get rid of uh, insects. We never want to spray anything because that has a tendency for increasing the tendency for it to get into the airways and trigger asthma. Also, mold is an important trigger. Um, mold is uh, some type a type of fungi, and this develops when water is, when water is used, sorry, water is spilled. Um, main thing to do with mold is to fix the leak. If you can't fix a leak in general between in 28, 4 to 48 hours, then um, you need to get rid of everything that's porous. Okay, That's one issue. And then generally when people clean up mold, they use uh, some type of disinfectant. A lot of times it's bleach, and this also aggravates somebody who triggers Somebody has asthma uh, episode. Okay. And finally, chemical odors, particularly from 
cleaning chemicals. You should use less toxic cleaning products, such as green, chem green chemicals. Okay? Also, when you apply chemicals or you apply uh, pesticides, make sure you do it when no one is around. Next. Let's talk about allergic asthma. Okay? Allergic asthma is an immune-type reaction. It's the body's protective response to a foreign substance. A vast majority of asthma cases are allergic. It doesn't occur after one exposure that develops over time, called latency. Once a person is sensitized, they react to even small amounts, and unfortunately also to similar substances. So you may have a reaction to one type of mold and also react to another one because they're so closely related. Um, allergic type asthma includes exposures to animal dander, bacteria, dust mites, mold, and pollen. Next. Irritant asthma. This is different from allergic because it usually develops after a single very high exposure. For example, someone is um, cleaning with bleach and they have a spill and you walk by. It's possible it could trigger asthma for you. It also could trigger asthma for the person that's applying it. This is like a direct burn effect on the airways, it a, a severe irritation. It's not related to the immune system and nearly always manifest symptoms within 24 hours. So if you're exposed today, it's possible you might not react for a, a day later. Smoking is also a risk factor for uh, irritant type asthma. We know that in children, uh, close to 500,000 um, people react to this, children react to this, aggravated by smoking. Next. Just some basic stuff about green cleaning. You need to know the difference between cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfectant. These are all three different processes as defined by the FDA, EPA, and CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. Cleaning is basically water, detergent, and some type of physical reaction. And this gets rid of 99% of all dirt and germs, just cleaning well. I include this quote from Elise Pector, an industrial hygienist in the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Occupational Surveillance Program, and she says, we've become a germophobic society. The public has increasingly become convinced the surface isn't clean unless it's also disinfected. She's saying the overuse of disinfectants is not necessary. Uh, when you overuse disinfectants, you may lead to the spread of superbugs, and these are resistant to disinfectants. Proper cleaning procedures lessen the need to disinfect, okay? You still have to disinfect in high-touch surfaces. You also disinfect when there's um, some type of illness or outbreak. Key things about green cleaning, you have to pre-clean first. Like I said, it gets rid of most of everything. And then if you're going to apply disinfectant or sanitizer, do it then and specifically target areas. Green cleaning is very important. Uh, if you think the fact that someone could die from asthma following exposure to some type of trigger that happens to be a chemical, you see the importance of using green cleaning products. Next. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at the above email address. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Alicia. I will now turn the spotlight over to our second speaker and expert panelist. Um, Debbie Shrem from the California Work-Related Asthma Prevention Program. Debbie, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Alicia, for, provi for providing such a wonderful background to asthma. Again, my name is Debbie Shrem, and I work in the California Department of Public Health's Work-Related Asthma Prevention Program. And what, our, what the Work-Related Asthma Prevention Program does is we collect work-related asthma data in California and make recommendations to reduce exposures to asthma-causing agents. And I head up our Cleaning for Asthma Safe Schools project, and I'm here to talk with you mostly about my experiences with that. I will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, next slide, please. Cleaning products can cause work-related asthma. I was surprised to learn that because I was always told as a little girl and as an adult that cleaning products, that nothing can cause asthma, that you just happen to get it. Well, we find that that's not true. And I'm going to tell you a quick story. Like I said, we collect data on work-related asthma, and we collect that data by looking at hospitalization 
visits, workers' compensation claims, doctor's first reports, as well as emergency department data. And this is one of the cases we received, which represents so many more of what we actually get. Um, this was a 43-year-old high school custodian, and he had breathing problems, but he didn't know why. He noticed that his breathing got better when he was awake from work for a few months. And then when he returned to work, his breathing problems came back. He visited the emergency department several times and was repeatedly told he had bronchitis. He finally received an asthma diagnosis and attributed it to the, what he was using in schools to clean with, the bathroom disinfectant and floor strippers. Sadly, one year later, he left his job because of his breathing problems. So this was an example of what we consider new asthma, new asthma onset. Um, it's one of the two types of work-related asthma. And what we're seeing is that people who never had asthma before may get it as an adult from the substances they breathe in at work. There are certain chemicals that may cause asthma in people who didn't originally have asthma, and ingredients that may cause asthma are known as asthmagens. The slide here talks about some of the common cleaning products, sanitizers, and disinfectants that do contain asthmagens and that people may get asthma as a result of their exposure to this. Once people have new asthma that started at work, it may affect them in a variety of settings, like at home or out while running errands. And the sooner a person's exposure stops, the better the outcome. Some people may end up having lifetime breathing problems or asthma from work exposures. Next slide. Oh, whoops. Next slide. We just did new asthma. Now we're on work activated asthma. Sorry about that. Okay. So for someone who's as somebody who already has asthma and then they go into work and their symptoms get worse while at work, there are many other substances in addition to asthmagens that may trigger someone's existing asthma, such as strong odors, fragrances, or irritating chemicals. Cleaning products can contain irritants that may trigger somebody's asthma symptoms. Um, with people who already have existing asthma. Work-related asthma can be serious and may make people very sick. Next slide, please. So like I said, we, we have surveillance and we track data around about work-related asthma in California. And so this is a snapshot of what we're seeing of people who have linked their asthma to cleaning products. So of all of our work-related asthma cases, 11% of them specifically put a link to asthma and cleaning products. And so now this slide is about what, look, what it looks like for that, those cases. So of those cases, one in five of the people worked as a cleaner. And the remaining 80% of the cases were people who were around during cleaning or after cleaning had recently happened. Over 50% of the cases were new asthma that started after they began work. In other words, their on-the-job exposures likely caused their asthma. Next slide, please. So based on this data, we created guidelines on healthy cleaning and asthma safer schools. Using safer cleaning products protects workers as well as anyone else that's spending time in the school setting. And while we don't have specific information about the impacts that cleaning products have on children in schools, it is likely that students are also exposed to products that can cause asthma or make their asthma worse. Next slide, please. So I'm going to outline four key parts to a healthy and asthma safer cleaning program. Um, the first that I want to bring up is products. There are lots of products on the market and it is hard to know what's what. Green Seal and UL EcoLogo are two independent third party certification programs and we recommend these types of programs by reputable organizations like Green Seal and UL EcoLogo because they certify relevant products for schools such as general purpose restroom and glass cleaners and some standards like Green Seal's GS37 do not allow ingredients that can cause cancer, asthma or harm our environment. Most school districts don't have the resources to determine if a product is green or healthy, and this is one way to ensure that. There are also multi-attributes, so in order for a product to get certified, they need to have health, meet health standards, environmental standards, as well as performance standards. Another key component to a healthy and asthma safer cleaning program is the training. It's important, as Alicia had mentioned, the difference between disinfecting and cleaning, and so if if there's training and people understand the difference between the two, they'll be sure to use the right product for the right use. They'll also understand the importance of 
cleaning high touch surfaces such as door handles and light switches. Um, and a lot of people believe that twice as much means twice as more, but that's not true. The glug glug method um, <laughs> is, is not the way to go for a healthy and asthma safer cleaning. Um, people who receive training will understand the importance of using only what's needed. They'll also understand that fragrances are made up of many, many chemicals. When people envision a clean room, many times it has a scent associated with it, but a clean room actually doesn't have a smell. Next slide, please. Equipment is another thing that people, another set of tools that people can bring in for healthy and asthma safer cleaning. There are lots of new technologies and some old technologies such as walk-off mats that um, are really important. Walk-off mats can be placed at, en placed at entryways and exits, for example, and what they do is they get rid of dust and mold and allergens from shoes. As a result, because the walk-off mats capture all of that when people walk in and out of a building, the floors are kept cleaner. And as a result, custodians clean less frequently, which leads to fewer chemical uses. And it also, of course, increases productivity for custodians. The picture we have here of the backpack vacuum cleaner, um, they used with high efficiency air filters. They effectively capture dirt, dust, and germs. They can also help remove allergens from carpets. So there are, a lot of, uh, there are lots of different types of equipment that are great to be using for healthy and asthma safer cleaning. And the other thing I want to point out is the importance of changing methods and procedures around cleaning. There are simple things that people can do, such as use a color-coded system for cleaning. So you have, in this picture under methods, we have a white cloth, which Patrick is using for a cafeteria table, and then you have a red cloth, which can be used for the bathroom, and the blue cloth, which can be used for desks. And that way you avoid cross-contamination. Thank you. There are several challenges that we experienced as we met with districts throughout California, and one that I heard over and over again was the belief that green costs more. Um, it's a very common misperception, and what's actually true is that when districts transition their products to greener and asthma safer and healthier products, they found that they actually either saved money or it was cost neutral. So that was a fun little myth to bust as I worked with districts. Um, one of the challenges also is the lack of staff resources. Um, somebody does need to take the lead um, on transitioning their school to asthma safer cleaning and healthier cleaning. Um, they need to educate themselves, train the staff, find new products, as well as identify vendors to work with. And another challenge I want to bring up is that a lot of districts aren't aware that they're actually using harmful products. Either they're not aware that their conventional products uh, can be harmful, or they think they're using safer products because they're titled green. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. Green doesn't always mean healthy. And so we address these challenges by creating the step-by-step -step guide for districts. Next slide, please. So there are many lessons learned and successes, and I'm just going to name a couple here. Um, there are 11 states that have green cleaning laws in place, and we are seeing, you know, over and above, the districts are successfully cleaning healthier. It can be done, and they're seeing great benefits, such as less absenteeism and reduced cleaning budgets. Once districts know more about the subject, they were very motivated to find asthma safer products because custodians and school staff, they're there for the kids. Um, they want to protect them. And once they found out that they were using products that might not be safer, they really wanted to make those changes. So knowledge brings along change. Next slide, please. The last thing I want to point out that we did that's included in our guidelines is we, we did a recommended labeling program. And, um, we put them in different levels. So level one um, prohibits the most asthma-causing chemicals, so that's the safest and the healthiest option. So that includes green seals, GS-37, as well as GS-53. Then there's level two, which prohibits some asthma-causing chemicals. And then level three, it may not specifically call out asthma-causing asthma -causing chemicals, but that it, they may still be a healthier choice than uncertified products. Next slide, please. And that is all I have for you today. I am available to help you with whatever questions you may have around asthma safer and healthier cleaning. We do have copies available of the guidelines if you're interested. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you again for the time and opportunity to talk with you.
Thank you so much, Debbie. That was very interesting. I thought it was fun that you were talking about the glug glug method, which I had never heard about. Um, but <laughs> it, I've heard that actually it's a very American cultural um, issue where we want instant gratification and therefore, you know, we can see when the stain is removed or if it's a muddy surface and you see that it's now clean, but in terms, you know, we either want it to smell good or we want to need to scrub something. <laughs> so right. the need to overclean potentially or to use more product than we need, which of course is terrible both for our health and the environment. Um, so training us out of our natural methods <laughs> is always a a challenge. Well, thank you very much. Thank um, you. I'm, <laughs> I'm now happy to turn the spotlight um, toward our third speaker. Um, oh, excuse me. I'm in DC, as you can tell, with the background noise. Um, Kimberly Thomas, the Executive Director of Plant Services and Custodial Operations for Clark County Schools in the district, um, I'm sorry, district, school district of Georgia. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be here and also would like to thank um, Alicia and Debbie for um, laying such a great foundation for just a couple of uh, remarks that I want to add to the conversation. And uh, I know one of the things Bree you said, you know, as far as the glug glug method does sound kind of a, an, an Americanized term, but it is alive and it is breathing and it is true. And, uh, and so we do um, work with our staff a lot here in Athens and I'm sure as many others um, who are um, on this green cleaning journey try to do also um, to try to um, train our staff to understand that more doesn't necessarily mean effective and it's what you use and how you have your cleaning procedures. Uh, so with that, I just want to bring you greetings from Athens. Again, as I said, Clark County School District where we have uh, probably just a little under 15,000 students, about 20 for um, school facilities and um, and we do um, practice green cleaning as a daily practice is what we have been um, um, teaching ourselves to say and making sure that our our staff our administrators and our community understand um, that transition and we have been honored um, to have some um, you know be able to, to show some leadership in this area next slide please I want to talk a little bit about some of the issues that we face in our school district and um, hopefully it's not as much preaching to the crier but, um, so much as just kind of sharing some of the things that have worked for us, some of the challenges that we've seen and um, hopefully when we get to the question and answer session, you know, just to be able to get some feedback because we'd love to hear some of your questions as well. But some of the things that we have faced in, in Clark County, um, as you can see on the screen, we wanted to um, come into our green cleaning program uh, with a couple of key things that we um, talked about from school nurses with some of our principals, our custodial staff, as well as our maintenance staff and have a targeted focus on how do we improve indoor air quality in our schools, how can we improve what we do as far as cleaning and maintenance, and how can we continue to have effective communication and support? And so along that thing, going back into improving indoor air quality, um, we had a concentrated focus when we came in four years ago to try to establish a baseline, if you will, on how effective were our HVAC systems. Because we have, you know, talked about it, um, and you've heard on um, some of the information from Alicia talking about how effective, you know, respiratory um, illnesses can be, how debilitating they can be for students as well as staff. And so we wanted to try to ensure that what we have in our school systems are effective. How often are we checking our filter changes? How often are we making sure that, you know, we have um, our water towers, cooling tower equipment, um, putting out uh, fresh, clean um, air into our classroom and our administrative environment? as well as making sure that we have those scheduled. We want to make sure that we have a baseline and we schedule these things and so that we can also train our custodial staff as well as our building maintenance staff on how do we control moisture and mold since a lot of times that can be some of the early triggers that some of our um, uh, staff kind of notice um, walking into rooms, it, the damp type of smells or seeing visible signs and being able to have a a, a program in place. So what would a teacher 
do if she walks or he or she walks into the classroom and they see a spot on their carpet? Um, you know, do they immediately start um, looking at different checklist items that we have provided to them to say, okay, do we see a water source? Um, it could be maybe water was coming in from a window that might have um, not been closed properly or uh, a leak um, that you know, stayed in a carpeted area or along the sink. Um, just looking at those types of things. So we do have checklists available for our teachers as well as our custodial staff. Um, looking at integrated pest management, and um, uh, we already had information on that from, from Debbie, and so we won't go back into that other than to make sure that in our contract with our pest control vendors that they adhere to the policies that we want. And then if we have any questions, we can provide that information to our community uh, and to our teachers. Cleaning and maintenance, as I mentioned earlier, green cleaning is a daily practice. Um, when we came in four years ago, um, we had a targeted focus to see what worked, what didn't work, and we have been able to, to manage to um, diminish our cleaning chemical usage from about 45 products all the way down to two. And uh, we're also taking steps now where we're um, kind of um, piloting engineered water so we can really look at how effective our cleaning practice can be as a program with using engineered water. Um, green purchasing. We have a board policy in place that supports um, reducing the environmental footprint that we use in our plant services and custodial operation and where we really look at how we purchase as a business and as a district. And that's very important to have that type of support um, from the top administration all the way down to the various departments that have to purchase um, chemicals, materials, any type of supplies. And really um, checking those labels, as Debbie mentioned before. And then source control, again, how do we manage our materials and supplies to be as effective as possible and keeping um, the sustainability at our for forefront? Um, if, the, if we have to go and, and purchase um, floor scrubbing pad for our machines, are, are we really targeting um, the traditional paths that we've used in the past, or can we now move into looking at things that are more sustainable, maybe paths that might be bio, uh, paths that would be biodegradable? instead of um, leaving a heavy environmental impact. And uh, one of the other things on this slide also is um, having advocates and cohorts. Um, one of the things that we're very proud of is that we have been able to work with a safety committee and having building inspections where we are targeting things um, inside of classrooms that can be asthma triggers, um, even though we have plenty of teachers that like to have a quiet, comfortable space, which might include throws and, 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 and pillows, uh, what they call their reading nooks. Um, those things can be very um, bacteria addictive. And we target those types of areas to see how we can train our, our, our teaching staff to make those less uh, of an asthma trigger for the students who use those areas. We can get to the next slide. As you can see, some of the numbers um, that we have targeted for our asthma care plans within the, um, in the school district, this information came straight from our school nurses. And so this kind of has, it gives us a baseline for where we can try to target um, cleaning in certain schools where we're seeing the asthma numbers um, increase. And what we can do is working with our school nurses and with individual schools to, re to reduce um, the students who might have um, respiratory concerns. As you can see here in, we have our elementary schools, our middle schools, our high schools um, labeled, and these are the actual um, students who had missed 15 days or more, and these numbers are tracked by the school nurses. And then once they um, have this information, they work with our head custodians as well as with my staff uh, for our building maintenance to try to come up with a targeted cleaning plan. And what we kind of have, have noticed in these numbers is that we have about three schools that really kind of skew um, the absenteeism. And so with those examples from fiscal year uh, 
2012 through 2013, and then um, having targeted cleaning plans in specific classrooms um, and working with the nurses to try to improve education, the nursing staff sending home information um, to the parents on what they can do at home as well as working with our staff to make sure that we have targeted focus. We have been able to see how we can allow our cleaning focus, our maintenance focus to work in conjunction with school nurses to try to reduce the numbers of, of, of students who are affected by um, particular tri uh, triggers. Next slide, please. Okay, what are some of the ongoing prevention efforts that we've done in Clark County? Uh, we conduct the routine um, inspections of our school environment. As I mentioned before, we're doing um, building walkthroughs, and that includes our custodial staff, our maintenance staff, as well as the principals, and our safety coordinator uh, for the school district. And we're looking for anything that's unsafe. Um, lamps, uh, a lot of times, those lamps just attract a lot of dust, and they're really not needed. So we work, you know, from a standpoint of having the principal on board for their particular school to try to have um, some education for the teachers to say, hey, we want you to have a warm, inviting environment in the classroom, but there's some things we can do to declutter um, the room to make it a safer environment for the students. Um, and so we felt that that was very key to add in. Um, and again. As you see on the slide, weekly building walkthroughs, looking for safety issues. So it's more than just once or twice a year. If we have continuous inspections, then the hope is that we can make these classroom environments uh, much more safe, uh, safer and healthier. Um, having a regular chemical lab inspection and removal. Again, here we have uh, worked with um, new teacher orientation to have our um, hazmat um, vendor come in and actually walk them through what a safe lab looks like so that we can remove any unneeded chemicals from um, the lab spaces and also we can um, track what's going into those areas. Develop a preventative maintenance plan and we use a web, a web based system where we can um, actually electronically track um, the preventative maintenance and again check for how many times we've done our filter changes and, and keep those things on a cycle, just for one example. Train cleaning and maintenance staff on protocols. We have added um, more training um, this past year on uh, with our custodial staff on what does what would the um, mold and mildew um, uh, things look like inside of a classroom, how we can uh, make these rooms safer and healthier versus just work, just worrying about just traditional cleaning. Because we um, want to make sure that our staff really understand what their role is in public health. Um, and then we do a lot of professional learning days where we have webinars and things like that on days when students are not in school to kind of have all of the custodial and maintenance staff train as a larger group. Next slide. Um, ensuring material data um, sheets or uh, available to the staff. We do have the notebooks um, at each school and each administrative building in case we have any questions from our community or our, or our um, teaching staff to want to know what products we're using. And we're happy to say that all of the products we use have some type of green um, background except for just targeted um, um, products that um, we might have to use. Um, so as I said, we practice green cleaning as a daily practice. Um, clean, remove dust with microfiber and absorbent materials. We had a really good session on that from Debbie, so I won't go into that a lot, other than that we do find benefit to making sure that our staff understands the color coding system, and most importantly, our customers in the schools understand what those red cloths mean and where they should only see our staff working with that color versus yellow, which was in the gen which, which would be in the general areas. And so they're on board with it. And even from the standpoint of making sure that um, instead of at the end of the, the school year when they send home the information on what the, the students should come back to school with, we have suggested and our um, instructional services staff have, have picked up on the idea of sending in empty spray bottles and microfiber cloths so that they are on board with trying to support green cleaning in individual classrooms. 
and then we fill those bottles, um, spray bottles, with our uh, Greenfield certified disinfectants, and they use microfiber to clean. And again, Debbie also mentioned using um, vacuum or backpack vacs to help with filtration, and we do that as well here. And um, the last thing there is having an internal policy to purchase energy efficient and environmentally sensitive products as a priority. Slide. And um, here are just some of the things that I just wanted to point out. Of course, it's not all of the benefits of green cleaning, but just some of the ones I just wanted to pull out that um, what our program has tried to target promotion of environmental sustainability as a daily practice and not just something that is only relegated to cleaning. Um, we want to um, you know, look at our water usage, and we have worked with our local um, county government on making sure that we reduce our water consumption on athletic fields and in our schools, um, working on an energy efficiency program throughout the district to put in foot pedals in our kitchen um, areas to try to, um, to only use the amount of water that we need is one example. Um, looking at energy, um, changing out light bulbs in the classroom to energy efficient LEDs, and overall um, looking at the environmental footprint. Uh, reduction of exposure to harmful cleaning products um, where we are trying to work more safely, and we have been able to see our employee um, accident and injury numbers go down as a benefit of working with less chemicals and having more of a water-based um, cleaning process. Uh, we went from uh, 22 accidents the first year, uh, 15, and then uh, last year, and only nine. Um, uh, the year before last and only nine for this past year. So we're seeing the benefits with our people, um, with our staff working more safely and, uh, and not being exposed to um, harmful chemicals, which could trigger respiratory problems as well as allowing them to work more safely in the school. And one of the last things I'll point out there is um, the, another benefit is trying to have more of a, a best practice as a business model and streamlining our equipment and material purchasing by not having to purchase so many chemicals and cross-training our staff and using those resources across the board from custodial to maintenance staff and encouraging communication. Next slide. And these are just some of the things I wanted to just highlight as far as what we talk about when we say best practices, where um, last year we were able to win a Green Apple Day of Service Award for the district as a whole um, because um, as we value communication and, and sustainability as a business process, we have worked actively um, with our local government and our teachers to provide um, support for school gardens, greenhouses, um, what we call in greener playgrounds, we're planting trees and things like that. All of those things kind of tie into a larger issue of getting kids out uh, and, and certainly um, the children who have asthma triggers, being outside in healthy, greener environments has been um, noted to help them um, to do better in their test scores. Uh, next slide. So that's it for me, just to hopefully give you a highlight of what we've done in, in Clark County Schools. Thank you. Kimberly, thank you so much, and thank you to our three panelists. Um, Kimberly, you had mentioned that occasionally you bring, um, I think you were saying, with the, uh, the microfiber cloth, the concept of cleaning into the classroom so that the students can support what is being changed and learn more about you know, the, the correct way. That sounds fascinating to me. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Excellent. All right. Well, again, thank you so much to our three panelists. And now I have a quick presentation um, about Green Seal. Um, so as, as they've mentioned several times, all three of our panelists mentioned third-party certified products. Um, so Green Seal is one of the third parties. In, uh, we're the number one third party in the US. Um, our mission, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back a bit. Uh, thousands of schools, as was mentioned, across the country from K to 12 uh, and private schools and higher ed require their procurement teams to purchase Green Seal certified products because they know that they work. Um, I, I think all three actually mentioned performance testing. Um, so you know all products have gone through performance testing. You know that they're safer for students, staff, and all school or building occupants. 
and you know that these products, as Kimberly mentioned, you know, in terms of green cleaning, it's not, it is absolutely about health, but within that, it's also about the environment. You know that these products have a, a smaller environmental footprint, and that's a great lesson for students. So here you can see all of our staff, um, and we're talking about transforming the marketplace. We're shining a spotlight on leaders in the marketplace, the leadership products and services, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Green Seal was founded in the 1980s. Since that time, we've had 31, we've developed 31 environmental leadership standards, and we've certified 4,000 products and services. And we've also been specified by 24 states, possibly more at this point, um, and hundreds of universities and school districts, as well as municipalities. So what that means is that states are putting into place policies and procedures, even legislation, that requires their purchasers or their procurement team to purchase Green Seal certified cleaning products for use in their schools and office buildings. Beyond cleaning products, we also certify bathroom tissue, um, paper towels, paints, coating stains, and sealers, and many on this call probably know that those are also triggers and can be difficult for those with respiratory issues. Same thing for laundry care products, um, windows, food packaging, printing, and writing paper. So manufacturers apply to get their products Green Seal certified so that they can demonstrate a product's effectiveness and they can demonstrate the environmental and leadership qualities. So for example, um, what exactly does that mean when I'm saying environmental leadership? Well, Green Seal certified products have zero or extremely limited amounts of harmful ingredients like carcinogens, asthmogens, reproductive toxins, and they've also been tested for biodegradability, aquatic toxicity, and they must have reduced packaging. Um, so as I mentioned, each of the categories I just mentioned on the last slide can be found in one of our, our 31 standards. So if you'd like to know what it means to be an environmental leadership floor care product, you can go onto our website and for free download our floor care product standard. All of our standards, again, are for free as PDFs on our website. Some of them are extremely technical, so for some of you who enjoy that, it can be fun or it can just be confusing and <laughs> we're happy to explain anything um, about our standards. And in fact, you can see the progress of our standards uh, we publish everything, we describe references, and in what is called a rationale document, we describe the process of developing or revising a standard. Um, so we're very proud of that process. And in fact, right now, if anybody is interested, we have a two of our product standards, laundry product standards, GS48 and 51, out for public comment. We're revising the idea of cold water wash, um, what temperature is for cold water in laundry, and so we would love to hear your feedback. Anybody, any public member who is interested can um, go onto our website and they can uh, sign up to be a stakeholder to comment, uh, either disagree or support the changes in the standard. So what does it mean for a product to go through certification? Um, well, we do not take the word certified lightly. There is an evaluation, there is an on-site audit, for the manufacturing plant, and there is ongoing monitoring to ensure that that product doesn't sway, doesn't change its formula, that if we call it certified, it remains certified based on the standard. Um, so we've already talked a lot today about the benefits of a green cleaning strategy, and on this slide I want to mention, I think it's already been mentioned, but to highlight team morale. Um, I have uh, spoken to custodial teams who have said specifically we feel that when they purchase Green Seal certified products or we undergo a green cleaning um, training, we feel that our employers care more about us. We feel more like professionals. We feel like we know that we're going to go home a bit healthier than we would have last year prior to green cleaning. Um, and there's actually lots of information out there in terms of reduced absenteeism, um, just like Kimberly was talking about in terms of students. The same goes for custodial staff. Um, when we're talking about getting certified as a cleaning service, currently we have several school districts. Uh, we have Harvard and we have Howard, uh, Howard School Districts in Maryland. We have University of Maryland and Virginia um, who have been GS42 certified for their cleaning services. So um, I'm not sure if everyone can see it, but for handouts in the handout section of GoToWebinar, I have uploaded for your interest the GS42 standard. Take a look at that if you're interested, see what it means see how Greenfield has described 
leadership when it comes to green cleaning. So here it is, Howard County Public Schools. We're in touch frequently with Olivia Klaus, um, who was the real champion of getting Green Seal certified. And um, obviously, so Kimberly's district, it sounds like they are really gung-ho. They have everything extremely organized. They have their checklists. That's fantastic. Maybe they've looked into GS42 and seen what we do. Maybe they're comparing it. Other school districts feel like they need a push. They need somebody to come in, and maybe they're a little less organized than Kimberly, and they need somebody to audit or to push them in the right direction and ensure that they are doing what they promised to their community. So that's where Greensill comes in. Um, again, you know, a lot of groups choose not to get certified, and they use GS42 as a guide. Both are great options. You know, it, it just, it's your choice as a custodial team member. Um, Harvard University, for example, early on in the game, got Green Seal cert, uh, certified to GS42. And uh, you can find it on their website. You can find press releases. We're quite proud of that. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. And that concludes Green Seal's portion of this webinar. Thank you so much to our expert panelists for providing an in-depth look at asthma, indoor air quality, and asthma prevention in schools. And thank you to those who joined us today as attendees. If you have any additional questions for our panelists or for Green Seal staff, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. My name is Bree Welzer, and I am an environmental scientist in Green Seal's Science and Standards Department. Head on to Green Seal's website at greenseal.org to find contact information.